reigns, R-E-I-G-N, in you. You got to wake up in the morning saying, I'm God's child. You got to walk around saying, I belong to God. You've got to go in the way saying, I belong to God. I'm a child of God. You've got to tell folk, for God I live and for God I die. Touch somebody say, I ain't ashamed to say I love the Lord. I love the Lord. He heard my cry, pitied my every groan. Long as I live and troubles rise, I'll hasten to his throne. Touch three people say, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Does he reign in your heart? Does he reign in your life? Is he king of kings and lord of lords? Is he very God of very God? He's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He's Jehovah Shalom. He's El Shaddai, the almighty God. I love the Lord. Do I have a witness here? Do I have a witness? Does he reign in your heart? And thou shall have no other gods before me. And if you seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, shall be added unto you. Touch somebody say, I'm going to get mine because he reigns. He reigns. He reigns. He reigns. He reigns. The door of the church is open. Good evening and welcome again to Bible study. Lessons from the cutting room floor. Well, we've had some weeks off, some days off, some time off. We've had a little bit of time to uh, reflect on the lessons we have learned and studied, to share some of the insights with others, and to get ready for a new and exciting fall season. And we're back now with Bible study on Thursday night, 7 o'clock, right after the evening news goes off, right after we finish listening to what's happening in our nation and what's happening in the world. We come together to hear what God's word is telling us about what we face and what we're enduring. I want you to know God is doing a mighty work in all of our lives. A lot's going on here at New Psalmist, and I hope that every Thursday night you'll meet us here for one hour, for one hour of Bible study. You don't have to get in the car. You don't have to drive anywhere. You can sit right in front of your computer screen or your phone or your iPad right in your home, and you'll be able to study God's word with us. We want to make sure you get to know God's word and to know the God of our salvation who speaks and ministers to us each and every day. God is doing so many mighty things in our midst. You heard my phone go off to let you know that he's really working in a mighty way. These are the things that happen when you do live broadcasts. Well, listen, let me just remind you also that coming this or this Saturday, Saturday morning at nine o'clock, all the brothers meet me for our monthly breakfast. We'll be on Zoom, so go to newsarmist.churchcenter.com and sign up to be a part of our breakfast. And then at 11 o'clock, we are baptizing. Yeah, that's right, we are baptizing. We have so many persons to baptize who've given their lives to Christ. We have over 130 some, and we're doing some of them right now. And so this, this Saturday morning at 11, if you want to be baptized, you go to newsarmist.churchcenter.com and you sign up to be baptized. And Sunday, Sunday is the pastor's 46th anniversary. Yep, I've been here 46 years. I plan to just keep on moving. But the team said, no, we want to pause. We didn't pause last year. Let's pause this year and celebrate what God's been doing through us together. 
So this Sunday morning at nine o'clock, meet us online, meet us in the building. You can sign up to be in service at newsomers.churchcenter.com or you can go right to our website and sign up, register to be in church with us Sunday. I do hope to see you this Sunday. I hope you can make it and be a part of the service. My wife and I will really be blessed. And listen, just a couple of shout outs before I move forward into the lesson tonight. I want you to know my wife is doing so much better. She had a minor procedure uh, last week and she's doing so much better. And prayerfully, she'll be in church with us this Sunday. And Joshua and Candace, our youngest son and daughter, have had their third child. And then our youngster is... The jewel of the family right now. Sister um, Lillian turned um, 10 and is having her, and is celebrating her 10 year birthday. Uh, that's Walter and Jarette's daughter. And now Chandler is here. Chandler Van Leer Thomas is now here, third child of Joshua and Candace Thomas. And my wife and I are shouting up and hollering and screaming because God has sent us a sixth grandchild. It's hard to believe we remember when each child was born and now we have six grandchildren. So thank you for your prayers for them and keep on praying for them. For my wife and my son and daughter, keep praying for them that God will continue to strengthen them and bring them where he wants them to be. Listen, lessons from the cutting room floor preaching these weeks over an understanding, hoping that we get an understanding of who God is in this season and what he's doing in our lives. This week is pastor's anniversary, but next week I'm going to be talking about it's in you, so don't fight it. Trying to help us understand that. And then next, the week after that, taking it to the next level because God's taking some stuff to the next level, because we are on a march toward fresh fire. Fresh fire is going to be awesome in November. It's going to be virtual, but different kind of virtual. So be prepared for that last week in November, the week right after the last Sunday, that Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I think it's November 30th, December December 1 and 2. We will be having fresh fire, and I want you to be ready for it. It's established and revived. God is establishing us in this season and he is reviving us. And I want to start there in a sense today by helping you put things in their proper perspective. Psalm 37 is the foundation for the sermon I preached this past Sunday. And if you haven't worshiped with us from Sunday and you feel like you need church right now or this week, need to go to church before you go to bed, you need some church tomorrow, you need to worship God, then join us on YouTube. Go to YouTube, youtube.com backslash New Psalmist BC, or go to YouTube and just search New Psalmist Baptist Church and share Sunday's message. Share Sunday's message from Sunday the 19th, September the 19th, putting things in proper perspective. One of the hard things for all of us to come to grips with is handling the emotional disruption and eruption that comes in tough situations. Sometimes I think we emotionally respond before we intellectually respond. Our emotions go back into memory land and they charge up so that the adrenaline can fire up because we know we either have to fight or we have flight. We have to please or we have to appease. We have to get ready for what's coming our way. And emotionally, we began to fire on all cylinders. Now, when we are firing on all cylinders emotionally, it doesn't mean we're always thinking clearly or that we're always thinking optimistically. Sometimes our memory kicks in and we remember the last time we faced something like this. But when our memories kick in, the emotions attached to the memory kick in also. So that, let me give you an example. Oh, I went out to lunch one day and had a marvelous lunch. So whenever I remember that lunch, 
what was on the menu, what we ate, what was served, da 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 da. I also remember the emotions attached to it and how good I felt being there with the crowd I was there. I remember when the doctor told me I would have to have surgery years ago. I remember that, that moment when the phone call went through, the doctor and I talked, what he shared with me, what he spoke to me, how he explained what would be done and why it would happen. But there were also emotions attached to that memory, fear, anxiety, nervousness, concern, worry, all of that. So when I think of that moment, I also feel and or refeel those feelings. Life has a way of bringing us a lot that triggers memories. And sometimes those memories have positive feelings attached to them. And sometimes they do not. And when those memories have negative feelings attached to them or certain kinds of feelings, there's a disruption that takes place in us. And that's true for everybody. That is true for each and every one of us. None of us is cool all the time. None of us has it together all the time. Sometimes we're wondering how we are going to make it. We look at the, the environments in which we live and we wonder how we will survive them. The psalm that is before us today is written with that intent in mind. It is written with an understanding that people face a variety of experiences and those experiences have a way have a way of disrupting the normal flow of how they deal with problems and situations. That sometimes it can be absolutely overwhelming and taking you down. When I read Psalm 37, I began to understand that it's not really a psalm of praise. Some of the Psalms, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. It is not a lament, a sadness, an expression of how bad things are. I am poured out like drink in Psalm 22. It is not music, a song sung on a sense as they were making their way to the temple. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. But instead, Psalm 37 is a recognition of so many experiences that each of us goes through and how to look at them differently, how to see them not just in the moment, but to look at them in the context of how your life and how God has been moving. In other words, don't isolate anything that's happening to you. Always be able to put it in its proper perspective. Put your life, put your circumstance, your situation in proper perspective. That's why the, the psalmist starts off, don't fret yourself because of those who do evil or be envious of those who do wrong. Why? For like the grass, they'll soon wither. Like the plant, the green plants, they will soon die away. The psalmist says, I am going to give you a series of statements that I want you to lay into the foundation of your life. These are the things that will hold you and keep you as you move and maneuver through life. This, these will be the rebar in your concrete. Whenever you see concrete walls somewhere in, and you begin to say, or, 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 or even center blocks, really, center block walls, you'll often say, oh, they look so strong and whatever. But that's because inside the concrete, there was put what's called rebar, metal bars, 
to hold it together, to make sure that whatever hits it doesn't break it apart. And the psalmist says, I want to give you proverbial statements, statements that have been tested, statements that are true, to build or to use as the rebar in the construction of your life, to put in the foundation so that no matter what hits it, even cracks it, it won't break it. This is what will hold you together. Psalm 37 is not about calling us to action. Because a lot of times, you know, we think that everything God is doing is trying to call us to do something. No, sometimes God tries to really give us clarity. We often say, I don't understand what God's doing. I don't understand what God is up to. Sometimes, every now and then, God pauses in what's happening in your life to give you some clarity. Psalm 37 is a clarifying psalm. It is a major effort from the psalmist to lay rebar all through our soul so that whatever comes up against us will be able to stand. Refrain from anger, turn from wrath, do not fret. It leads only to evil. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. All this stuff planted in us to remember. Because when we remember, we will then understand. See, he is giving us an alternative memory. These foundational blocks put in us. Every now and then, something somebody says to you comes back to you and it holds you. An alternative memory, an alternative memory of a conversation that's an alternative to how you responded to a situation. The psalmist says, I want to give you some proverbial statements that are going to make you able to hold on when tough times come. Why? Because tough times come. And my brothers and sisters, we are living through tough times. I think I shared it with one of our prayer groups because every Tuesday night, you know, we gather for prayer. And incidentally, click out Bible study to some of your friends right now. Share this link with some of your friends, even while we're talking, because I think this might help some of your friends deal with some of the things that they're going through. The psalmist says, I need to help you realize that God wants you to understand what's happening in your life. And the only way for you to understand all this crazy is to put it in perspective. You've got to put it, you, you, you and I often think this is some isolated incident. I remember being younger thinking I was the only person ever going through whatever it was I was going through. Or I was the first person ever going through this. Only to find out that just about everybody was going through it or everybody had gone through it. That it was not unique to me. It was not you. I was not unique to this reality. Listen, worrying about your children, how they're handling all of this and how, how they're maneuvering and whether they're going to be sick is not unique to you. 200 and some thousand children became infected with COVID in one week, and then 200,000 plus children became infected the next week. In certain states, they are imposing or looking to impose critical decision making when it comes to health care, rationing it or determining who shall get what. Some persons are, some states, some hospitals are not allowing persons from other states to be flown to their hospital because they need to save the beds that they have. They're discovering that some folk who have had COVID and have recovered may still have some long haul symptoms that they're battling. Oh, my brothers and sisters, this is, this is not unique to you. Wondering about, shall you, should you go this place or should you go that place? Is there something wrong with you for being nervous about this? There's nothing wrong with you. 
But this is the reality in which we're living. And that's just COVID. That's just COVID. We watched with horror when someone fell from a plane wheel in Afghanistan. And we saw the nation rocked and reeled as it tried to get people out of Afghanistan. American citizens and Afghanis who had helped America in its 20-year war against the Taliban. And they're bringing them to America and to other places, trying to resettle them and give them a new home. And then yesterday and the day before, we watch what's happening to our brothers and sisters in, from Haiti who are being ridden down, in a sense, by men on horses, who are being shipped back, deported back to a land that has been ravished by an earthquake and then a tropical storm where the government has, has suffered a coup and the president, once president, lay dead. Some of them have never been in, haven't been in Haiti in years. They came to America from yet another country, but were deported while we are at the same time welcoming others. We're shipping back the least and the, those who are in the most precarious of positions and those who are people of color. One might have a lot of reasons to drop for all of that, but, the, but when we look at it, we cannot, we cannot write anything down without recognizing these are people of color. Our citizens or people are being killed on the streets every day. You, you wonder where you can walk and where you can go. These are the realities in which we live. And if we're not careful, we will take them all out of context and begin to think that we alone suffer this or we are the first to suffer this. And there is no plan. There is no way to get through this. And the psalmist comes leaping up saying, oh, no, baby, let me tell you. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to give you a call to action. I'm not trying to get you to rally right now. I'm trying to get you to understand. I'm trying to get you to understand something. I'm trying to get you to understand who you are in God and who God is in you. Woo! I'll shout and dance on that. I cannot say I knew that at 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, or 21. Who I was in God and who God was in me. Both of those are learning experiences that are coming together to make the firmest of grips. Who I am in God, but who God is in me. Who I am in God is always being challenged by the reality in which I live. Who God is in me is always being strengthened as God reinforces who he is in the reality in which I live. And that's where the psalmist comes burling in, burling into the people of God to help them understand who they are in God and who God is in them. I love this little passage that we chose for Sunday sermon. It, one of the Proverbs just before the one that was the text says, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Putting things in proper context means you got to see it in a bigger picture. You've got to see all of this in a bigger picture. Before you fall apart, before you cry, before you kick the dog, before you cuss out the, the, the neighbor, you got to see what you're facing in a larger picture. Everything we're living through has to be seen in a larger picture. Haiti didn't just start struggling. Haiti hadn't recovered from the earthquake 10 years ago. They're the poorest country in Central America, in the American continent. They, they didn't just start struggling. They needed help that has been slow in coming, that has always been slow in coming. The Voting Rights Act that we are praying that Congress will enact even after African Americans stood in line for hours upon hours to cast their vote to make sure that Democrats win in office. And yet those same Democrats have questions about whether these measures are necessary. And the only reason they question it from a place of authority 
is because African Americans marched to the polls to give them those positions of leadership. This is not new. This is not new. Some who would think that the, the Civil Rights Act, or rather the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, all these amendments just happened. Oh no, my brothers and sisters. With blood, sweat, and tears they came. Oh no, when we look at the summer last year, of all of those that lay dead, all of our African-American brothers and sisters who suffered for so much, so many who lost their lives. We look back, there was a, a museum to lynching in Montgomery, Alabama, a museum to lynching to remind us, lest we ever forget, lest we think that the pain and hardship that we endure now is some new aberration of this injustice in America. No, my brothers and sisters, put it in context. Emmett Till's mother had to grieve over her fallen 12-year-old son for something that made no sense now and made less sense then. We must put everything in context. The struggles you're having with children, the struggles you're having in your job, the struggle you're having with your family, the struggle you're having with life, put it in its proper perspective. See it as God wants you to see it and then see yourself in him and see him in you and see the movement to get you through so that you triumph victoriously in the situation in which you find yourself. God is always calling us in a situation to be victorious. Now, victory gets defined by God, but he is always calling us in a situation to be victorious, to be victorious. For Jesus on the cross, victory was being able to say, it is finished. Victory was being able to say, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Victory sometimes is to be able to be resilient and bounce back, to be able to be patient, to be able to hold up, to be able to withstand, to be able to having done all still stand. Victory is to be able to walk with your head up when you walk through a storm, victory is able to say, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Whatever situation God has you in, he has you in it for victory. But before you can do, get victory, you have to understand. If you don't understand, you'll mess up the moment and you won't have victory. But if you understand, you'll be able to have victory that your steps are ordered by the Lord. Your steps are ordered by the Lord. Put that in the foundation of your life. Put that as a come back to. Everything you're coming back to, why am I here? Because God put me here. Now the question is, if God put me here, no, God put me here. Why does God want me here? What is the work I am to see, to do? Jesus said to his disciples, look out. See the field, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Why am I here? Well, I don't understand why I'm here. Jesus said, look out, see the field. The harvest, are lab the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Wherever I put you, I put you there for victory. Whatever victory is in my plan, I put you there to bring it to pass. Now, what does that mean? That means God has such a high regard for you, even while you may be suffering from a low regard for yourself. God, somebody missed that. God has a high regard for you, even while you may be suffering from a low regard for yourself. You may be thinking, I can't do this. I don't know how I'm going to manage this. Oh, God, this is blowing me out of the water. I can't take much more of this. God says, I put you here for victory. 
I may have put you here with a team to work with. I may have put you here by yourself. But it doesn't matter how many are here with you. You are here to be victorious. You're here to be victorious. And if you're here to be victorious, you have to also understand this. I put you here because this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity to rewrite the pages you've written about yourself. This is your opportunity to write yourself in what we call Hail Gesheska, salvation history. This is your opportunity to step forward, to be seen, heard as witnessing in the program of God. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. In the New International, it says, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Now, wait a minute, did you get that? The Lord does what? Walk by you, um, pat you on the back, uh, try to sweet talk you, um, bring you some candy. No, he makes firm. He allows your feet to grip even in the place where you feel uncertainty trying to make you sway. Somebody better get that. He makes your feet grip in the very place where uncertainty is trying to make you sway. You don't understand what's happening. You don't think you can't figure out all of this craziness that's going on. You're being demanded to do this, sought after to do that, looked after to do this. It's coming in. Demands are coming on you from so many different places. But the, psalm, the psalmist says, I want to give you a proverbial statement to make as one of the rebars in your concrete foundation. To lay in the foundation of your soul, in the bottom of your soul, in the gut of your experience. I want you to lay this tile. It will be one of the pillars that holds things up. It'll be a foundational pillar that your steps are ordered by the Lord. He puts you where he wants you. And wherever he puts you, he puts you there to have victory. And that victory is an opportunity for you to write yourself into the salvation history that God is bringing forth. And he will make your feet firm. He will make your ankles strong. The ground may be sifting under you, but miraculously, you will have balance. One of the things about aging that many persons realize is that one of the things that, that you really have to work at is balance. Because for some reason, your balance begins to wane as the years march on. That's why you see more people with canes, or more people walking slowly or with help, because their balance does not seemingly stay the way they want. God says that can help you emotionally and spiritually. But the way I keep you ready is by putting you in those situations and making your feet firm and helping you to learn how to stay balanced, to work on your balance in the sifting, shifting situations of life. Aware of the fact, aware of the fact that I put you here for victory. You know, people will put you in a lot of places for a lot of different reasons, but God always puts us where he puts us for victory, for the victory of his plan and program, and for the opportunity to have us written into the salvation history. He is marching forward with us. The Hells Gashetska, that is his moving plan, for everything. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He makes firm. He makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. So what does that mean? That means as you transition from God, what are you doing? To God, I know you're in this. 
At the same time you were transitioning that, you were being strengthened for what you were facing. Did y'all get that? The moment you transition, strength flows into you. When David arrived in the camp of his brothers and they were afraid of Goliath, nobody wanted to go out and face Goliath. But when David transitioned into this is a moment of victory and opportunity for God. The strength to defeat Goliath poured into him at the same time. He became stationary in the situation in which he was facing. Facing the biggest force of that world. But his, his balance was there. He could run in the uncertainty and battle in the trepidations with the certainty that the Lord our God is with me. And as Paul would later say, if God be for me, or as the psalmist would say, if God be for me, who can be against me? Help me somebody. And so the psalmist adds this little bit because he needs to help us understand something. He says, though he may stumble, he will not fall. You, you may trip over something. You, you, you will not crash and burn. You will not crash. Why? Because the Lord upholds him with his hand. He's trying to put things in perspective. Now, Pastor, what do you mean putting things in perspective? He's trying to help you to see the, the broader scene. You're just seeing the situation, but you, you, you are caught up in what is in front of you, the situation but you're missing the totality of the scene. You're missing the whole scene. You don't see who's there on your side. You don't see who's working with you. I've said it before, I say it again, you look around this room and you see different things. You see space, you see pictures, you see this and that. Why? Because the naked eye can only handle so much in its, in its ability to see. There's certain things that we can't see because we can't see in those spectrum. But my brothers and sisters, this spectrum is teeming, or rather this space is teeming with things. Things are at our resource to use. I, can, I am wirelessly connected to computers, to clouds, resources. All of that's happening in this space. I can't see it with my naked eye, but it's happening. My phone is ringing from somebody calling me from somewhere across the country. And it's ringing right here. And I can't see any of that in this room. There are no wires connecting it. Though we fall, the Lord upholds it with, with his hand. You can't see God's hand on you, but it's there. Just like you can't see the telephone waves. I, I sometimes wonder how much, some situations I've been in, I've wondered, how big is the army God sent to walk with me? Somebody missed that, but you ought to shout on that. Some situations I'm in, I wonder, how many resources did God divert to me today to be able to handle this? How much is God putting on my side right now to be able to make it through this? Oh, my brothers and sisters, I, I look around the room and I see the same thing in this room that I saw the last time I was here. But every time I come in this room, I come in with different situations and circumstances bursting in my life. And when I come in with that, God sends in with me everything I need to do fully, brilliantly, and completely what he wants done. I need somebody to get that. You have to put things in their proper perspective. And then he drops it. Verse 25, he begins to drop it. He says, listen, I, I'm saying all of this to you. Not because I, I just learned this in ministry school. I remember as a young preacher, and, and I've always had this belief um, in ministry. Whatever God teach me, I'm going to teach you. If he teach it to me on Monday, I'm trying my best to get it taught to you by Tuesday. And when I was a young preacher, I'd learn things and I'd teach it right away. And my, my, my rationale was I was always making space for the next thing God was going to teach me. And I've lived my life by that. Now I, I enjoy it. But one thing I know for sure, 
Over the years, I've learned tons of things. But over the years, I've come to understand more than I've even learned. Oh, I got tons of facts and figures racing through my head. But the psalmist says, let me talk to you because I have not only been on the scene a while, I've been where you are and I've got years from there to tell you about being there. I got years from there to tell you about being there. My God, this is what he says. I was young and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. He says, now this is a piece of rebar I want you to put in. And when things are going crazy, the winds are blowing up against your wall, they're not going to crack or crumble. You just go back to this. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And I'm giving you that even though you can't make that statement. To be honest, I really couldn't make that statement at 25. I didn't even know what it meant. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. I can make it now because I have a long enough track record to be able to say it. I've seen enough life to be able to make this assertion. I'm old, but I have been young and I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging for bread. I've never seen them get in that position. I've never seen this happen. Oh, the first time it happens, you wonder, well, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to manage this? How am I going to deal with this? The psalmist is an older man. This is not the words of a novice. This is an older person who's been around life a while, who's had times of anxiety, times of fear, and times of reflection. He's had an opportunity to live through and then reflect upon. He's had opportunity to climb and then look at where he arrived. He's had an opportunity to have enough life under his belt to be able to say, I think I know some things that are true. I was young, but now I'm old. This is where he gives his clarifying statement for the entire song. All the things he said, and you wonder why you should believe him, because I was young. I was your age when I questioned them, when I doubted this, when I worried about this. But now I'm old. And there's some things I've come to understand that you don't need to fall out over evildoers. You don't need to fight fire with fire. And you need to understand this. The righteous are never forsaken. Forsaken is a big word. It means that God walks out or that you're walked out on. You're left. You've been given up on. They're forsaking the search. They're giving up on the search. I felt forsaken. I felt like I was all alone, that everyone walked away from me. That I was left alone. Thomas says, I, I'm old, but I have been young. I've never seen those who are in right relationship with God left alone. Now, let me, let me back up a second. So what does that mean? What is, that, what is one of the things I have to work on? I must always be working on my relationship with God. The foundation, the rebar is in me. My concrete is not going to crack, fall apart, and break. I have been strengthened with this foundational truth. But I need not forget to whom this truth is given. It is given to the righteous. 
Now, the righteous are not just the non dolly wears, the no makeup wears, the no earring. No, the righteous are those who are maintaining and seeking to maintain a right, a right relationship with God. They're trying to be God's son in whom he is well pleased. Remember at the baptism of Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's righteousness. Being the son that the father can say, or the daughter, I am well pleased. I am well pleased. He says, I'm old, but I have been young. And I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging for bread. It just doesn't happen that way. God has a way of holding us up in every situation in which we find ourselves, making it possible for us to be able to get through, making it possible for us to stand, making it possible for us to fight, making it possible for us to be delivered, making it possible for us to say the Lord will make a way somehow. He says, I'm old, but I've been young. And I'm telling you this. I'm telling younger people this. Do you know that half our population is wrestling with realities they've never seen before? Do you know people born in the last century have not, who have been born, who have been born in this century do not know a world without war? They were born, if they were born in 2000, that might have been the closest they come to knowing a time without war. 2001, we have the, the World Trade Center being blown up and we go to war in Afghanistan and Iraq and we've been fighting ever since. African-American people have never known the absence of war. Maybe not fought in distant lands and maybe not fought in conventional form, but we've always been in a struggle and a battle trying to make it uphill. The psalmist says, I'm old, but I have been young. And I've never seen those who work at making their God proud, who work at writing themselves in the hell's gesheska, the salvation history, who see themselves wherever they are as an instrument of victory for the divine and seizing the opportunity to place God's name in human history and their name in God's history. I've never seen God forsake such people. Woo! Now, can you say this about everybody? No, because he says the righteous. Somebody say, I feel like the Lord has left me. One question you ask them, well, have you left him? I haven't been all I should be. That's a, that's a, that's a um, roundabout way of saying yes. Then say, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought. And let us return to the Lord for he will abundantly pardon and have mercy on us. Every mountain shall be exalted. Every valley shall be, every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain shall be brought low. Comfort, comfort ye my people. Speak ye tenderly to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is ended for she has received double from the Lord's hand for all of her sins. Tell them, come back to God and God will heal you and help you. The psalmist says, I'm old, but I have been young. I've never seen those who seek to maintain that relationship with God that has God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well. How many of us are actually working on hearing God say, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. Not just whispering in your ear, you're okay with me. But whispering it out over the, ear, over the sound waves of the world so that it falls into every ear. That little voice that says, that's my beloved son. That's my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. And I'm well pleased because they are trying to make me proud in the way they live their lives, carry their lives, and fulfill my will in the earth. That's what the psalmist is getting at. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, 
nor their seed, their children, doing bad either. Now, does this imply they never fall? Oh, no, absolutely not. Notice, forsaken doesn't mean falling or, 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 or stumbling. Oh, no, he says you will stumble. You will stumble, but you won't fall. You will have terrible moments, but you won't be forsaken. Oh, no, you won't be forsaken. Let me, let me see if I can share with you a, a, a New Testament passage that lifts up the same. God has no intention of leaving us forsaken. Somebody might think, you know, I'm in here all by myself. No, baby, you misread, you misreading life. You're not in there by yourself. The very fact that you think you are in there by yourself means that you may be misreading who you are in Christ and what he's doing in your life. He is working things out for your good. He is giving you the strength you need to be able to handle what you face. Listen to this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this, is, that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Did you get that? Oh, no. Now, these things happen to us, but don't, don't get it twisted. No, no, no. We are, we are living examples of the comeback kid and the comeback girl. Oh, no, baby. We come back. Why? The psalmist says, I'm old, but I have been young. I have seen the resilience of the righteous. You may not always account it and equip, equate it in your mind, but somehow the righteous get back up and keep on keeping on. They are resilient because the Lord is with them. And how do they get back up? It's right here in the text. He upholds them with his hand. He lifts you back up. You and I don't get back up from some of the rough stuff we've been through just because we have a resilient mindset. Maybe there is somebody out there who does that. Maybe the, there are, but there, there's some of us who need the help of heaven. We need God to help us. We've been knocked down so many times. We've been pushed around so many times. We need God to help us. And some of us have grown to the point, not where we just need God to help us get up, when we get knocked down, we look for his hand to get us back up. That's a big difference. I'm not looking for God to help me back up. I'm wondering where God's going to help. No, 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 he's God. Gonna, no, uh-uh. But if I get knocked down now, I'm just looking at where's the hand because I know it's right here. So I can get back up. I have no intention of staying down. That's what the psalmist is trying to imply. That he needs us to understand that it is that our trust in God is grounded in that which is true. And what is his truth? Is it just book knowledge? No, it is experience. He has lived it. He has seen it. He knows God lifts you up. Oh, I, I, I love it that he has seen it. He doesn't just walk it by faith. He's seen God do this. He has seen God make a way. Out of no way. He knows what God can do. I need somebody to shout on that right now. He knows, he's seen it for himself that he's a way maker. He's a heart fixer. Experience has taught him something he cannot deny. Experience and what, you know, there were, there were in church history, there have been great periods when folk wanted to discount experience and only go with the word. And others who wanted to discount the word and go with experience. The two goes hand in hand. Jesus walked in our experience with the word. Somebody missed that. He walked in our experience with the word. He gave us the word in experience so that that word would live in experience and then become a foundation for us in every experience. 
The psalmist says, my experience validates this. And I'm asking you, whose experience validates what God can do today? Whose experience in here today validates how the Lord is making a way in your life and how he's opening doors and using you? Maybe you have stopped remembering you are the righteous. What do you mean, preacher? I, I go to church. No, your aim and mission in life, if you are the righteous, is to live your life in such a way God says, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Righteousness is deemed by God, done. It's an act done by us, but deemed done by God. You can clean the kitchen, that, that's your work, but it's deemed clean by the one who gave you the task. Somebody missed that. You, you can cook dinner, but it's deemed cooked well by the one who eats it. You may have done what you call the righteous work, but whether it's deemed righteous is in the hands of God. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I don't know about anybody else. I want to hear him say of me, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Because that will even help me get past the stuff I am pleased with. Somebody missed that. Go ahead and shout on your own. That if God says to me, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, I promise you, I will go in them closets that I've got locked, grab everything and put it in a green plastic bag and put it on a trash can and let heaven's angels scoop it right up and trash it. Why? Because God said he's pleased. I won't whip myself, kill myself, beat myself or anything because God says he's pleased with who I am. Some of us are still haunted by yesterday to such a level that we can't do the work in today. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Every morning you get up, live to make that statement, an echo from the first century to the 21st century or the 22nd century where God says of you, this is my beloved son of whom I am, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son in the 20th century of whom, 21st century rather, in whom I am well pleased. And keep this in mind. You will, stu you will stumble. You'll have some moments when you're down in your word or whatever he says, but you will not be forsaken. Psalm 20 says, help cometh from Zion, from the sanctuary. In fact, let me, let me just read that line to you because sometimes, you know, just hearing scriptures read have a way of helping us. May the Lord answer you, Psalm 20, verse 1, when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary. In Psalm 20, there's a great line I love. It says, some trust in horses. Some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And because of that, because of that, when I put this thing in its proper perspective, I realize I ain't never been at the mercy of life. I've always had help, whether I could see it or not, over my head. There's music in the air. In the words of the other song, all day, all night, angels keep a watching over me. The Lord knows my down sitting and my uprising. The Lord knows my thoughts from afar. I've never been forsaken. I've never been at the mercy of life. The God of all God has been with me. The God of all gods, Lord of all lords, has been with me. Let me put my life in proper perspective. He'll never leave me. Huh. First part of this I was talking about yesterday. I've never seen. But now I talk about the future. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. The Lord of hosts is with us. 
The God of Jacob is our refuge. In COVID, in a pandemic, in a racially intolerant world, in a city of crime, in a time of trouble, he will be with me. And I may not finish the fight, but I'll have a hand ready to hand the baton to keep on running this race. Because I'm running my lap. Somebody else is running their lap. And one day, we're going to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servants. Come on up and rest a little while. Oh, well, that takes us through the lesson for the day. I hope it was a blessing for you. I hope you got something out of this today. Put things in perspective. Put what's happening in your family in perspective. I don't know. This ain't the first time you, you've seen some of this stuff. This ain't your first rodeo. You saw this, this, the problem you see in your house, you saw in your sister's house three years ago. The problem you see between your, your son and daughter, you have between your husband and you. And you. you know, the, the, put them in proper perspective and then speak out of that perspective that God was pleased with. And help folk who are coming along learn faith because you, plant, you put the rebar in this season of construction in their lives. It's a season of construction for a lot of people. And I'm inviting you, just like I'm calling upon myself, to help put the rebar in the foundation so that folk can stand and having done all, still stand, trusting in the trustworthiness of God. He will not fail me. He will be there. Well, I hope today's lesson reached you. We're getting ready to lift our offerings in a moment, and I hope you'll be in the baptismal service. And brothers, I hope you'll be in our breakfast Saturday morning, but I hope all of you will be in the anniversary services on Sunday, either in person or worshiping online, and bring your family and your friends. Come on, be in worship with us. I'd love to see all of you on Sunday. So let's get ready to give out gifts of love. Keep in mind what God is doing in this church. He's moving in some mighty ways, moving in mighty, mighty ways. I want our prayer teams praying for a fresh fire, established and revived. I'm putting an installment on it today. We are established and God is reviving us. It's tough, but we've been revived. I'm not in the same headspace I was in last April or last May. No, 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 baby. I'm established now, firmly, and this is the will of God concerning me. And I'm being revived daily. God didn't bring me this far to leave me now. So let's give our offerings, ushers. It's time to give. We're going to place our offerings. You can give online. You can use Givelify or PushPay. You can go to the New Psalmist website. You can text it or you can mail your offering to New Psalmist Baptist Church, 6020 Marion Drive, Baltimore, Maryland, 21215. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we give out gifts now. We thank you for this word and may it live in our lives and hearts. I believe somebody's going to be blessed right now, God. I believe somebody is being blessed right now. So take the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts. And let them be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Bless the gifts we give for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you are a subscriber to YouTube, subscribe now to our channel and hit notify. But be a subscriber to our channel and join up so we can send you information when we're putting things out. God's moving in a mighty way. Mighty way. Text this out to your friends. Tell them to come on and share Bible study. We'll be having it. It'll be online so that they can come and share the word and grow. Tell everybody, this is the season. This is the season of the righteous to make God proud. To hear him say, that's my beloved child in whom 
I am well pleased. God bless you. Take care. I love you much. See you Sunday.